four times the sun had risen and set. And now on the fifth day cheerily called the cock to the sleeping maids of the farmhouse. Soon were the yellow fields in silent and mournful procession came from the neighboring hamlets and farms, the Acadian women. Driving in ponderous wains their household goods to the seashore, pausing and looking back to gaze once more on their dwellings, ere they were shut from sight by the winding road in the woodland. Close at their sides their children ran, and urged on the oxen, while in their little hands they clasped some fragments of playthings. Thus to the Gaspro's mouth they hurried, and there on the sea beach, piled in confusion, lay the household goods of the peasants. All day long between the shore and the ships did the boats ply. All day long the wains came laboring down from the village. Late in the afternoon, when the sun was near to his setting, echoed far o'er the fields came the roll of the drums from the churchyard. Thither the women and children thronged, on a sudden the church doors opened, and forth came the guard, and marching in gloomy procession, followed the long imprisoned but patient Acadian farmers. Even as pilgrims, who journey afar from their homes, and their country, sing as they go, and in singing forget they are weary and wayworn. So with songs on their lips the Acadian peasants descended, down from the church to the shore, amid their wives and their daughters. Foremost, the young men came, and raising together their voices, sang with tremulous lips, a chant of the Catholic missions. Sacred heart of the Savior, O oh, inexhaustible fountain, fill our hearts this day with strength and submission and patience. Then the old men, as they marched, and the women that stood by the wayside joined in the sacred song, and the birds in the sunshine above them mingled their notes therewith like voices of spirits departed. Halfway down to the shore, Evangeline waited in silence, not overcome with grief, but strong in the hour of affliction. Calmly and sadly she waited until the procession approached her, and she felt the face of Gabriel pale with emotion. Tears then filled her eyes, and eagerly running to meet him, clasped, clasped she his hands and laid her head on his shoulder and whispered, Gabriel, be of good cheer, for if we love one another, nothing in truth can harm us, whatever mischances may happen. Smiling, she spake these words, then suddenly paused for her father, saw she slowly advancing, Alas, how changed was his aspect. Gone was the glow from his cheek, and the fire from his eye, and his footstep heavier seemed to the weight of the heavy heart in his bosom. But with a smile and a sigh, she clasped his neck and embraced him, speaking words of endearment, where words of comfort availed not. Thus to the Gaspro's mouth moved on that mournful procession. There disorder prevailed, and the tumult and stir of embarking busily plied the freighted boats, and in the confusion wives were torn from their husbands, and mothers too late saw their children left on the land, extending their arms with wildest entreaties. So under separate ships were Basil and Gabriel carried, while in despair on the shore of Angeline stood with her father. Half the task was not done when the sun went down, and the twilight deepened and darkened around, in haste, the refluent ocean fled away from the shore and left the line of the sand beach covered with waifs of the tide, with kelp and the slippery seaweed. Farther back in the midst of the household goods and the wagons, like to a gypsy camp or a leaguer after a battle, all escaped cut off by the sea, and the sentinels near them lay encamped for the night the houseless Acadian farmers, 
Back to its nethermost caves retreated the bellowing ocean, dragging it down the beach, the rattling pebbles, and leaving inland and far up the shore the stranded boats of the sailors. Then, as the night descended, the herds returned from their pastures. Sweet was the moist still air, with the odor of milk from their udders. Lowing they waited, and long at the well-known bars of the farmyard, waited and looked in vain for the voice and the hand of the milkmaid. Silence reigned in the streets. From the church, no Angela sounded. Rose no smoke from the roofs, and gleamed no lights from the windows. But on the shores, meanwhile, the evening fires had been kindled. Built of the driftwood thrown on the sands from wrecks in a tempest. Round them shapes of gloom and sorrowful faces were gathered. Voices of women were heard, and of men, and the crying of children. Onward from fire to fire, as from hearth to hearth, in his parish wandered the faithful priest, consoling and blessing and cheering, like unto shipwrecked Paul on Melita's desolate seashore. Thus he approached the place where Evangeline sat with her father, and in the flickering light beheld the face of the old man, haggard and hollow and wan, and without either thought or emotion, even as the face of a clock from which the hands had been taken. Vainly Evangeline strove with words and caresses to cheer him. Vainly offered him food, yet he moved not. He looked not. He spake not. But with a vacant stare ever gazed at the flickering firelight. Benedicte. Bless you, murmured the priest, in tones of compassion. More he fain would have said, but his heart was full and his accents faltered and paused on his lips as the feet of a child on a threshold. Hushed by the scene he beholds and the awful presence of sorrow. Silently, therefore, he laid his hand on the head of the maiden, raising his tearful eyes to the silent stars that above them moved on their way, unperturbed by the wrongs and sorrows of mortals. Then sat he down at her side, and they wept together in silence. Suddenly rose from the south a light. As in autumn, the blood-red moon climbs the crystal walls of heaven, and o'er the horizon, tightened like stretches its hundred hands upon the mountain and meadow, seizing the rocks and the rivers and piling huge shadows together, broader and ever broader it gleamed on the roofs of the village, gleamed on the sky and sea and the ships that lay in the roadstead. Columns of shining smoke uprose, and flashes of flame were thrust through their folds and withdrawn, like the quivering hands of a martyr. Then, as the wind seized the gleeds and the burning thatch and uplifting, whirled them aloft through the air, at once from a hundred housetops, started the sheeted smoke with flashes of flame intermingled. These things beheld in dismay the crowd on the shore and on shipboard. Speechless at first they stood, when then they cried in their anguish, We shall behold no more our homes in the village of Grand Pre. Loud on a sudden the cocks began to crow in the farmyards, thinking the day had dawned, and anon the lowing of cattle came on the evening breeze, by the barking of dogs interrupted. Then rose a sound of dread, such as startles the sleeping encampments, Far in the western prairies or forests that skirt the Nebraska, when the wild horses affrighted sweep with the speed of the whirlwind, or the loud bellowing herds of buffaloes rush to the river, such was the sound that arose on the night as the herds and the horses broke through their folds and fences and madly rushed o'er the meadows. O 
overwhelmed with the sight, yet speechless. The priest and the maiden gazed on the scene of terror that reddened and widened before them. And as they turned at length to speak to their silent companion, lo, from his seat he had fallen and stretched abroad on the seashore. Motionless lay his form, from which the soul had departed. Slowly the priest uplifted the lifeless head, and the maiden knelt at her father's side and wailed aloud in her terror. Then in a swoon she sank and lay with her head on his bosom. Through the long night she lay in deep, oblivious slumber. And when she awoke from the trance, she beheld a multitude near her. Faces of friends she beheld that were mournfully gazing upon her, pallid with tearful eyes and looks of saddest compassion. Still the blaze of the burning village illumined the landscape, reddened the sky overhead, and gleamed on the faces over her, around her. And like the day of doom, it seemed to her wavering scenes. Then a familiar voice she heard, as it said to the people, Let us bury him here by the sea, when a happier season brings us again to our homes from the unknown land of our exile. Then shall his sacred dust be piously laid in the churchyard. Such were the words of the priest. And there, in haste by the seaside, having the glare of the burning village for funeral torches, but without bell or book, they buried the farmer of Grand Pre. And as the voice of the priest repeated the service of sorrow, lo, with a mournful sound, like the voice of a vast congregation, solemnly answered the sea and mingled its roar with the dirges. T'was the returning tide that far from the waste of the ocean, with the first dawn of the day came heaving and hurrying landward. Then recommenced once more the stir and noise of the embarking, and with the ebb of the tide, the ships sailed out of the harbor, leaving behind them the dead on the shore and the village in ruins.